Today she is, is a senior flight test engineer at NASA on the Electric X-57. Not long after arriving in the California <clears throat> desert, she developed a love of backcountry flying and vintage aviation. But just this past September, she and a friend, Dustin Moser, who was going to be here but couldn't make it, had the honor of participating in the Legacy of Peace flyovers hosted by the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum on Oahu. And she was flying a 1942 uh, Stearman. <clears throat> this was the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, correct, on like September 2nd? Uh, so she's going to talk about how she got her uh, steerman over to, to Hawaii and some of the flying they did there. So please welcome Diane Barney. Hello, everybody. Let's just make sure we've got the IT sorted. Can you hear me okay? Oh, good. Thank you. Right. It's an absolute honor to be here, and thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, so there have been a number of wild decisions that have led me to this point where I spent my summer in Hawaii flying a warbird with my good friend. Um, but I'm going to try and scope this presentation to the Hawaii adventure itself. Um, so I'm going to try to keep my presentation short enough that we can do questions and you can ask me about different stories that interest you and I can, uh, and I can speak to that. Uh, this is Felix. We affectionately call the 1942 uh, Stearman that we picked up, oh, about three and a half years ago now. Um, that was a, another strange story about trying to fly across South America. Money fell through and didn't work out. We found ourselves with a biplane, so, you know, what else are you going to do? Go to Hawaii, I guess. This is just a small snapshot of that month we spent over there. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview on the warbirds and the logistics. I'm going to keep the uh, stories focused on the USS Essex. We used a Navy ship to get over there. And then we spent a month uh, funded by um, the, uh, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum uh, while we were there and uh, supported by the Army as well as the Air Force. Ooh, point it that way. So let me just uh, give you some idea of what happened. This is just the generic timeline. So the way this started out was Dustin. He has a phenomenal nose for adventure. He's fantastic at finding shenanigans. He saw an article in the paper, I think in February, March time frame, uh, saying that a bunch of warbirds were going to go to Hawaii. And he remembered the 50th anniversary in Hawaii where they uh, took the Carl Vincent and they actually allowed everybody to take off from the aircraft carrier. And that's what he was really hoping for. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that. We had to use cranes the whole time. Um, but on July 26th is when we actually loaded the aircraft on the USS Essex in San Diego. Then about two weeks later, we met the aircraft in Hawaii. We were there for the unloading. Uh, it was a bit of a shenanigan to actually get the airplane from Pearl Harbor to Hickam. We'll go into a little bit of detail on that. But uh, middle of August, we had the airplane back at an airport able to fly it. And then two weeks basically unsupervised in Hawaii with our airplane until the uh, flying events, which were staged out of Wheeler Army Airfield, which was contemporary to World War II and is still in operation as a helicopter base. Uh, that's where we staged the three flying events, so the three aerial parades. Then once we conducted those, uh, we dragged the aircraft back over to the harbor, loaded it back up on the ship. I spent eight days at sea on the USS Essex as a civilian. That was fun. And then our last flight home to Tehachapi. The warbirds that were there with us, it was 14 aircraft that flew across the continental United States from as far away as Albany, New York, unrelated to myself, but the B-25 is owned by a gentleman uh, in Albany. Uh, so we had the two PBY Catalinas, which just about stole the show. They flew almost as much as we did over there. Uh, then we had, we had the B-25 that we mentioned from Albany, New York. We had a P-51 from Chino. TBM Avenger, and a Wildcat. I was very excited to see the Wildcat, a big part of what got me into aviation. You're chuckling because I already told you the story earlier. But um, like every little girl, I had a phase where I was obsessed with World War II aircraft and the Pacific Air War. Um, 
<laughs> Pause for chuckles. This is gonna be a lot more fun if you laugh at my corny jokes, I promise. Uh, but there was a flight simulator, Microsoft Combat Flight Simulator 2, so I sat at my little desktop computer pretending to be a World War II fighter pilot. And the airplane that it forced you to fly before you could play with the others was the Wildcat. So this is an FM2, uh, mechanically folding wings, a really fantastic little airplane. I just, I lost my mind when I saw it. We also had a T-28, not exactly World War II vintage. But the owner actually had a beautiful connection where um, his entire lineage was World War II, Vietnam, and so this was a very, very touching event for him. Uh, we had a Bearcat. I had no idea how big those airplanes were until I got close to this one. It's huge, it's like 8,000 pounds, massive. Like the Wildcat looks so little next to it. And then we had a whole mess of T6s. There were five different T6s. I'm not showing you pictures of all the T6s. There were just lots of T6s. This is the ship. So even though it carried aircraft, it is not an aircraft carrier. Oh, no, no, don't say that to the sailors. It is not an aircraft carrier. So there's no arresting cables, there's no catapults like you'd be imagining. And it's actually an old boiler ship, so it runs on diesel. Um, it's uh, 844 feet long, so and typically operates with Ospreys and uh, Blackhawk derivatives. So I think we had oh, what, H60 Romeos on board um, on the way back. Uh, fascinating setup. So you have the top deck, right, where you do all your flight operations and also store your large aircraft. So on the way out there, the B-25 and the two PBY Catalinas were actually on the top deck and they'd go wash them down with fresh water once a day to keep them from corroding to bits. Um, and one T-6 had to ride out there too. Then the rest of the aircraft were underneath in the hangar deck. Uh, so all packed tightly and lashed down to survive any rough seas that could occur. What you see at the back there, you can see, let's see, I think we got a little laser here. The back of the ship is actually open. That's open to what's called the well deck. Uh, so this is an amphibious assault ship, and the well deck is very important to this operation. So the ship can actually submerge, I think the captain said about 40 feet. So they can actually flood the interior of the well deck so you can operate things like Zodiacs running in and out so you don't have to worry about hoisting them. They just run right in or run right out, depending on what you need. Uh, and two aircraft elevators. So you've got one in view over here. Right here, it's in the down position, so that's actually level with the hangar deck that the steerman was stored in when it went out and when it came back. And then, yeah, that's the port side one, and then there's a starboard side one, which was broken. <laughs> machines are machines. Whether it's an airplane or a ship, they can break. <laughs> Let's talk about the logistics of how you get an aircraft onto an aircraft carrier when you're not allowed to land it there. Uh, I love this photo because it looks like we just landed in the middle of a highway and we're being pulled over by the police. We've clearly made poor decisions to get here. What's actually happening is we flew into North Island Naval Air Station, which was exciting for a couple of private pilots. So neither Dustin or myself flew in the military or anything like that. We don't even have extra ratings. We're, we're just private pilots who just bought an airplane that's kind of wacky. Um, so we landed at North Island Naval Air Station, and that was our first lesson in always ask about the arresting gear. Know where it is and know if it's deployed or not. Uh, so we actually, uh, so Dustin was the one who flew in this time and um, he decided rather than mess with the arresting gear at all, okay, it's 1,500 feet down the runway. Oh, that's plenty of room. We'll just land before it and turn off. No big deal. So, so Dustin does his usual backcountry flying, coming real slow, plop it down, is down in a few hundred feet. Tower gets on the radio. Wow, that is the shortest landing I have ever seen at this airport. So you could tell we were a little bit out of place, but we're really thankful for how accommodating everybody was, especially the Navy. So once we were um, at the ramp, at North Island Naval Air Station, we still had to get to the harbor, right? You don't typically put your aircraft ramp right next to your harbor. It wasn't too bad to deal with at North Island. It was only about a quarter mile. They just took down some fencing and then closed down the road for a really short period of time and they towed each aircraft over to the harbor. And then we had to do a craning operation. I think this was about the most stressful part of the trip for either of us. We know how to fly the airplane. We've been flying the airplane a bunch. We've been doing that for years. We've never lifted it with a crane. So we, we did a practice run two days prior to this. Uh, we had a custom bridle made by a lifting company in Bakersfield, and you can see it kind of here. So those are uh, steel cables, and then a nylon adjustable uh, rope back here. 
uh, that we hooked up to the steerman. So the steerman was originally designed to just be lifted with lift points on the top wing. So you can kind of see them up here where it connects, right? It's just bolted through the main spar, which is wood. Uh, we learned oh, about a, a month out, hey, one thing you guys might want to check, a lot of steermen are rebuilt with just cosmetic lift points. So if you just hook into them, they just rip straight out of the way. We're like, well, how do you get in there to inspect? Well, we got a mirror and we fidgeted for about an hour and we were able to get good enough, like, ah, that looks like a bolt through the spar. Yeah, that'll be good. Let's go with it. Uh, we, had, we had some buddies in the oil and gas industry who had a crane and we, we lifted it up about a foot and then put it back and like, all right, it'll, it'll be okay. Let's call the insurance company one more time. Insure, yeah, okay, we're good. And it worked out. So that's the steerman with nobody in it, about 150 feet in the air, because they needed to lift it from the dock all the way to the top deck. We did this you know, some different ways, but the first way we tried this was just straight from the dock onto the top deck. Well, remember I said it's, it's going to be stored in the hangar deck, so it needs to go down a little bit. Um, so it means you need to use the aircraft elevator. That was the facial expression I made when I learned I was able to ride the aircraft elevator with the aircraft. This was one of the, one of the most fun parts of the trip for me. Um, so the sailors were just phenomenal in handling the aircraft. This was something we were worried about, right? So they're used to manhandling military aircraft, and the military is going to foot the bill if anything gets damaged. We don't care if it gets scratched. We don't care. Well, this this is a delicate princess, <laughs> we, we, and is going to be a little unfamiliar to the sailors. Well. Uh, the, their supervisors had really gone out of the way to perpetuate a culture of, no, no, these airplanes are special, do not touch them, without first talking to the owners, and they couldn't have been more respectful. So at every step of the way, they were either talking to me or Dustin, hey, is this okay, is this too tight, is this too loose? Um, but it was terribly entertaining. They insisted on, no, we cannot move the aircraft by hand, we need to use the tug. It's a 20,000 pound tug that they used to haul around 80,000 pound uh, CH-53s for a 3,000 pound airplane. <laughs> Very skilled though, it was incredible how they were able to maneuver the plane so readily. Um, oh yeah, the, the best part though, uh, with the elevator and getting to ride it, um, the sailors thought it, it was just super funny to see you know, a relatively modern ship that's accustomed to Ospreys, you know, packed with World War II aircraft and they're especially enamored by the one big silly wooden biplane that came along. Everybody else is metal, we're, we're the only fabric and wood airplane. And um, one sailor had been running around with his phone in his back pocket playing the Top Gun theme. And I couldn't believe they thought this was funny, but it, it caught on so much that, um, so over, over the ship's announcement, um, it's a big deal when they move an elevator, right? Because you don't want to hit somebody, you know, as it goes down, you don't want somebody to fall off. You can really damage equipment if you don't do this right. And so they do a big announcement over the ship PA system and a port elevator moving in 10, so on and so forth. They make their call and then start blaring the Top Gun theme <laughs> over the entire ship as the elevator moves the entire way. <laughs> so this is a shot of the hangar deck and the steerman is approximately in the position it was in. It was tucked further in the corner there. It's a panorama shot so it's a little bit bent. You can see here is the opening where the port side elevator is. So the bow of the ship is over here. So you're looking straight at the stern here. And then you can kind of see the opening there for the starboard elevator. So that was, that was a general setup. So, you know, maybe 40 foot high, about 50 feet wide. So it was actually a really large space to be contained completely within a ship. So two weeks later, we met the aircraft at Pearl Harbor. Uh, this shot, like the photo itself is not all that spectacular, but I'm going to try and describe the feeling that I had when I got to Pearl Harbor, I climbed up on the top of the ship, looked around, and realized where I was. That's the USS Arizona, and that's the USS Missouri, right there. I had not realized how close the active harbor was to Battleship Row. It's right there. They still use it. They've just left the Arizona in place and have brought the USS Missouri there as well. Uh, I've never been in a place with just so much World War II history just packed into one little area. And the whole island was that way. You couldn't go more than a block without finding something historically significant. So that emotion aside, we still had a job to do, right? We still have an airplane on a ship. So I was talking with somebody about this prior to the presentation. Okay, you know, we described how we got North Island Naval Air Station, you just tow it down the road or a crane, you know, plop it on the ship, move it around a bit. 
Well, Pearl Harbor and Hickam, even though it's a joint base now, it's joint base Pearl Harbor Hickam, but that's only because as they were spaced out, they grew so big that now they're adjacent. Hickam's ramp and taxiways are still pretty far away from the harbor. It's about four miles if you were going to tow it. And so they decided it'd be just easier to throw it on a barge. And yes, they let us ride the barge. <laughs> yeah, so we went sailing on a barge right by Ford Island where we could see all the old PBY Catalina ramps you know, that are still battle damaged but undermined now. Um, as we got dragged out of Pearl Harbor and over to one of the docks at Hickam. So Hickam, uh, once we uh, got the barge over there with a the little tug, you know, they craned the airplane off. We were only lifting it like 20 feet in the air this time. That is much less stressful than how we started off. Uh, and then it, it's only towed you know, maybe a tenth of a mile until we're at the ramp. And uh, the Air Force was very kind. They donated hangar space for us so that we could keep the airplane there for the duration until we needed to go to Wheeler. And that's two weeks, right? Well, we, we wanted to spend that two weeks flying. We didn't want to be cooped up at an Air Force base where we would need to make a flight plan every time we started our engine. No, we, we're, we're used to not talking on the radio playing in the desert. So we wanted to go to at least a general aviation FBO, even if it was on a class Bravo airport. Hickam Air Force Base is kind of unique in that it is an Air Force base with no runways. It's adjacent to Honolulu International. So they have Air Force hangars and they have Air Force taxiways and then they taxi over to Honolulu International and use their runways. So I do have Hickam in my logbook, but no takeoffs or landings, just a half hour taxi. And yes, it took that long to get from Hickam over to the FBO. Half an hour, 0.5, zero takeoff, zero landings. <laughs> well, so we arrived in Hawaii. This was my first time in Hawaii. Dustin was there once when he was in grade school. And you're thinking, okay, Diane's gonna have all these great vacation pictures of sitting on the beach, drinking pina coladas at tiki bars. Well, no, because keep in mind we're in the middle of COVID. The whole state was shut down. So we needed like, special exemptions just to get there at all. And when I say shut down, I mean shut down. The beaches were closed, nobody on the beaches. All of the parks were closed. In fact, two of our pilots on this trip sat down in park benches in closed parks and got $5,000 tickets. They meant it, yes. <laughs> so we actually each individually had special exemptions from the governor to be in the state at all. So we flew in and we still had to do our two week quarantine even though we all had our COVID tests. These letters said, you can either sit in your hotel room or you can go maintain and fly your airplane. So what do we do? We're not sitting in the hotel room, no. It's like, all right, we, we can't eat dinner in a restaurant, but we can go play around with the airplane, so we're gonna go do that. I actually gave us these hats, so what I'm wearing right now, and said, hey, we've briefed up law enforcement, the police recognize these hats, so if they see you out and about, they're a lot less like, likely to, uh, to harass you. There were four hotels open in Honolulu, we were at one of them. Um, this event accounted for 50% of the tourism in Oahu for the month of August. Yes. <laughs> so with that picture, you can see why we did absolutely nothing but fly, which is just as well. This is a photo of Dustin enjoying the beach. You can see him fleeing the water. <laughs> so what's it like to fly in Oahu? So a part of the shutdown was inner island travel is not a good idea because if I, we went to another island, two week quarantine before we could come back. And we didn't, we didn't want to risk the trip, so like, all right, we're not gonna go land anywhere else, we're just gonna stay in Oahu. Oahu is 40 miles wide. If I were to drive to Bakersfield, I would have done Oahu twice. You can fit all of Oahu between LAX and Chino. So this is a much smaller territory than what we're accustomed to. But it was an absolutely fascinating place to fly. So there's two distinct mountain ranges on the island and there's an almost completely persistent trade wind from the northeast so it, it's so consistent that people use the wind as a, a geographic marker when making radio calls you have your windward side and you have the leeward side and it never varies it was always blowing about 15 to 20 knots i think we thought we saw 30 knots one day and it was good mountain winds because of those distinct ridge lines so it, that was something i hadn't really thought about till i got there but it's actually a lot like flying in the desert, Mojave and Tashu, what I'm used to. You have strong winds and you have mountains. It's just this time it's covered in jungle instead of Joshua trees and sagebrush. 
How many people here are private pilots or pilots at all? Okay. This airspace is a mess. It is an absolute mess. So we're, uh, we're based here at Honolulu International, Class Bravo Airport. Neither Dustin and I or I have taken off or landed at a Class Bravo Airport at this point. And now we're in a situation where if we want to go fly, well, we need to deal with all of it. Um, they were delightfully accommodating for us. We'd call it Boeing Stearman. I think they were like, okay, they're not from here. <laughs> they're going to need a little extra help. But um, we, uh, so we went and totaled up my logbooks from this trip. Our average flight time was half an hour because it just takes you no time to get from anywhere to anywhere else. So you have Honolulu here. You have another public use airport over here. You can see how close that is. It's right next door. Uh, you have Wheeler. So that's where we staged the parade events out of. And you do have one nice untowered little general aviation airport, Dillingham, up in the, up in the corner there. And then you have Marine Corps Air Station, Kanahoe. That's it. That's all you got. <laughs> we got to know it very, very well. Uh, it, it was absolutely unreal. It, it, so I don't think we went above 2,500 feet the whole time we were there, because why bother? But we, you could see the ocean you know, on the north and the south side simultaneously as you're flying across. Uh, just a really good time. Uh, one thing that was different that neither of us expected, was, you know, of course we studied the airspace before going over, um, you know, asked questions, you know, what are the peculiarities, right, from the FAA over here. One thing we didn't think to ask about, what do you get when you ask for avgas? Hundred low lead, right? Yeah, hundred low lead. Nobody's going to give you anything but hundred low lead. We haven't used anything but hundred low lead in how many decades? Well, when you go to Hawaii, they actually refine their own green 100 full lead. Yes, it's refined there. It's over at Barber's Point so that they don't ship it in. Uh, so what happens if you throw you know, fuel in your engine that has six times the lead content of what you're accustomed to? Well, one thing we noticed, we, it took us a while to figure out what was going on. Um, full disclosure, we didn't sump our tanks because we were so terrified of all the environmental policies. We didn't want them coming down on us, so we weren't sumping it and throwing it out. So it took us uh, longer than I care to admit to figure out we were actually running green fuel. Uh, we did notice that as we were flying, when we lean out the aircraft, usually you, know, you lean it out, okay, it sounds happy, you lean a little bit more, ooh, it's a little rough, ooh, too much, engine's off. There, there was no period of unhappiness. It was lean and we're off, oh no. Okay, I, that happened to me once in flight in Oahu where I had it leaned out and the engine just quit and I was like, oh, oh good. <laughs> Fortunately, it came right back up as soon as I popped the mixture in, but um, you know, lost, lost a few years of heart health there. Um, we did, uh, there was one flight where um, I, I was unfortunately pilot in command for this one. We were taking off out of Honolulu and it's the day before we're supposed to stage at Wheeler. So the one reason we're here, right, is to do these three aerial parades. Originally we are going to have all these community outreach events, we are going to have dinner with veterans. All of it was canceled except for the three aerial parades. So we absolutely must do these aerial parades. Day before I take off out of Honolulu. I think everything's fine. Engine's making power, we're climbing out, everything's golden. Dustin gets on the intercom like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, fine, what do you think I'm doing? Is that 22s overhead? That's kind of cool, you know, this is nice, we're going to Wheeler. Uh, he could hear what I couldn't hear from the front seat. That engine was popping and banging and angry. The guys on the ground at Honolulu, who were 200 feet away when I was at takeoff power, I talked to him later and asked, why on earth didn't you abort that takeoff? That sounded awful. I couldn't hear it at all from the back seat. So we, we land a precautionary landing over at Barber's Point. So this happy little general aviation airport here so we can do what we want without having to worry about any air interference. Um, we swap seats. Dustin's in the back. I'm at the front this time. He powers up. Wow, that sounds awful. That's getting a whole lot worse. Dustin gets in the intercom and is like, hey, how's it sound up there to you? What are you talking about? It sounds horrible. Can I, can't you hear that? Like, well, it turns out the back seater can't hear it. You have to be in the front seat close to it or at least near the exhaust um, outside the airplane. So we, we figured out, okay, plane's not happy. We don't really know what's going on. Our worst fear is that we have destroyed an exhaust valve, that it's stuck. Oh, gosh. <laughs> We're supposed to be doing a flying event in two days. Uh, fortunately, we just fouled the spark plug. That's all it was. So it, it took all of a couple hours to, to figure out. So that was a good scare, but that was our, our first mechanical issue 
managed to resolve it. We brought spare spark plugs with us. Uh, we actually, there's uh, two steermen on Oahu already, and the uh, couple who owns them, the woman actually runs the local AMP school, so she's got parts, she's got tools. It was not a problem at all. We're very lucky. So we got the airplane good to go. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're here to honor. Now, I'm sure everybody here, you know, this being Warbird Society, I, I, this room is full of history buffs, I'm sure. Uh, but I want to share with you the perspective of what it was like to see these sites in this day and age, so what these sites look like now. So what we were there to honor was not the attack on Pearl Harbor, what we were there to honor was the 75 years of peace since the end of World War II. So the USS Missouri was docked in Tokyo Bay when the Articles of Surrender were signed by Japan and World War II effectively ended. Uh, we did get a chance to tour the USS Missouri um, so there, it, if you ever have the chance, it, it's an amazing experience. But there is a plaque um, on the USS Missouri, on the deck, on the spot where, we, where they had the table where the signing actually occurred. Uh, so the USS Missouri was not actually in service at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack. The keel was actually laid, but um, it, it was not uh, in service until a year or two later. So it, it was constructed and in service in time for the signing of um, the Articles of Surrender, but it served all the way into the 90s. So it's actually a display on the USS Missouri where they had Tomahawk missiles. So that's, that's the, the breadth of history that this ship saw and was a part of. And it was fascinating to see the synthesis of World War II history with something as modern as Tomahawk missiles. And of course, the USS Arizona uh, and its memorial. Uh, some things that surprised me about it is the flag that is flown at the memorial is actually flown by the USS Arizona that is attached to the superstructure of the ship as it sits on the sea floor. Another interesting fact is that memorial was actually designed by an architect, an Austrian architect, who was interred in an internment camp in the US during World War II. And one other piece that I think was interesting, most of the funds for the memorial did come from Congress. Uh, but almost half was actually made up by a celebrity at the time in the early 60s, Elvis Presley. He bankrolled the rest of it, and his name does not appear anywhere on the memorial, not a single thank you plaque per his request. So this was not about him, but he wanted it to occur. So just a, a really interesting connection there. And I want to take the opportunity to mention the USS Utah, so another ship uh, that was destroyed in the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, and it's on the other side of Ford Island, uh, was not in service as a battleship at the time. It was actually a target ship, but it still had a crew. It had a crew of 58 men who perished during the attack. And one of those men actually had the remains of his young daughter who had passed away from polio several months prior, so the cremated remains. Uh, so the memorial is offset. It's not surrounded by really any other historical sites. It's just on its own on Ford Island, which has companies operating, government operating. But it sits on its own with uh, 58 sailors guarding the soul of one little girl. It's a, a very touching place to go see, and I'd encourage you to read up on the USS Utah. And the last connection here, and it's a story I won't go into in detail because it is Dustin's story, but his uh, grandfather did serve in Kanahoe, so K Bay, during World War II. And so for our flying events, we had a memorial patch to him. He just passed away a couple years ago. The parade routes themselves, which we did make, we got our aircraft fixed and working well enough to go fly them. So Dustin flew the first one. And uh, it started, of course, at Wheeler. Remember, that's where we were staged, which was an airfield that was contemporary to World War II. So we took off, departed south, and the first site we see is Fort Island. Fort Island and the Missouri and the Arizona are featured more heavily in the second parade route, but of course you always pass it. So Fort Island is not currently operating. You may have noticed on the chart that it's not actually marked as an airfield anymore. Uh, it hasn't been disused for terribly long, but the concrete is uh, a lot of weeds growing through it at this point. The steerman would have been fine operating off of it. A nose wheel really shouldn't be. It was considered in good enough shape uh, to be an alternate field. We were all briefed up on, hey, you know, if anybody has an engine problem, Fort Island is not a bad place to wind up. Then we have Bellows Field. 
So Bellows disused, it's currently a recreational area for the Air Force. It's a Bellows Air, uh, Air Force Station right now. This is what it looks like in present day. Uh, we did notice, um, listening to radio chatter, that the CH-47s at a Wheeler, uh, Wheeler being a helicopter base now, uh, were practicing over there landing in that area and using that area. But it's uh, fairly well deteriorated. Uh, Bellows was uh, attacked during uh, Pearl Harbor. There were two fatalities and six injuries, even though it wasn't the, the primary. Kanahoe Bay, which was Naval Air Station Kanahoe Bay during World War II, during the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, 27 PBY Catalinas were destroyed at K Bay. Uh, still a Marine Corps air station now and very active. Um, it was really fun. Uh, we did manage to land there. We were supposed to do an open house, but the very, very last flight on the very last day in Hawaii, we asked for a low pass and they cleared us the option and so we put the wheels down. We weren't gonna pass up that opportunity. <laughs> the Opana radar site. Opana radar site is known for being the first operational use of radar in a defensive, uh, in a defensive operational arena. They were the first ones to spot um, the Japanese uh, on their way to attack Pearl Harbor. Unfortunately, they thought it was a flight of B-17s. But the Opana radar station is still in use today with upgraded hardware. A Holly Eva fighter strip. So this one should hopefully ring a couple of bells. This is where um, Lieutenants Taylor and Lieutenant Welch were able to take off in their P-40s and get six combined kills uh, during uh, Pearl Harbor. It was the only fighters that managed to get off the ground and it was out of Hala Eva airstrip. It's kind of hard to pick out. It was, ever, it was never paved. Uh, so it was always an austere field, so it was an auxiliary to Wheeler. Uh, but they had, a, for the purposes of dispersing the aircraft, they did have several P-40s there, which is how Taylor and Welch were able to drive to Hala Eva and take off and do what they did. And then, of course, right back to Wheeler. Now, I snapped this shot in the air thinking, oh, yeah, I just want a nice photo of the aircraft on the ramp. Uh, anybody spot anything a little funny there? Sorry, I'm staying right in your way. See that white patch? That's a fire extinguisher. You see these two aircraft that are parked 90 degrees nose to nose? <laughs> Yeah, the Bearcat, the Bearcat and a T6. This is the one video I'm gonna inflict upon you. It's four seconds, I think we can endure. There it is. Yeah, so that video was taken by a bystander. So what you just witnessed was the, the Bearcat striking a fire bottle. So when we think fire extinguisher, you think little handheld guy. No, no, we had a, we had a helicopter fire bottle. So they sit about yay high, so about three feet high, and you tow them around, they're big and they're heavy, um, and they're not great for Bearcat props. So the Bearcat struck that, became disoriented because he just had an unexpected explosion, and is now blind from white powder all around him, whips around and hits Park T6, which did have two occupants. Everybody was physically okay, only minor injuries, so everybody survived this one. But this was the aftermath. So we did get all the airplanes home. That was a bit of a to-do, but you can see the Bearcat threw a blade. Um, so we think that happened uh, when it actually struck the T6. But if you look at the T6's propeller, it was prop to prop. So everybody has some engine damage here. Yeah. So the T6 is being fixed up in China right now. Uh, the Bearcat, the Navy, eminently gracious, uh, said a donated hangar space said no we'll do the paperwork to get all your mechanics on field it won't be a problem for you to get parts there and you can fix up the Bearcat at North Island Naval Air Station if you want to ferry it out so Bearcat's still there being worked on but again just endless thanks to the Navy for tolerating all of our warbird shenanigans yeah T6 wasn't too bad right because you can pull the wings and you can put it on a trailer um, so, so that was pretty straightforward the Bearcat though yeah, it's got folding wings, but it's only the wingtips that fold. So they needed special permission from the governor to drag it down the highway at 10 a.m., <laughs> close the road for them. That was Parade Route 1. We made it. <laughs> uh, so Parade Route 2, uh, we flew Parade Route 2 twice. I flew it once, Dustin flew it once. Uh, we almost missed the last event, the last event being September 2nd, because when we got out there the morning of September 2nd, we went to crank, we got nothing. We had a dead battery. 
So he had the airport manager, we flagged him down, we dragged his truck over, and uh, much to our surprise, he was okay jump-starting it with his truck just sitting right next to our propeller arc, and we're like, all right, thanks. But we, we got it cranked and good to go, and we, we took off to within the minute of when we were supposed to. Uh, so this parade route didn't have as many sites. All the exciting stuff is on the other side of the island. So we were flying around the west side. So we took off, went north this time, past Dillingham, and then down, back, and around. So Dillingham, this was one name I didn't hear in person, so I could very confidently say a pronunciation and it would assuredly be wrong. But it was an operating field during World War II and it was actually at one point sustained B-29 super fortresses. So this was a significant airport at one point. Um, now it's just a wonderful general aviation untowered field, which is unfortunately slated to be closed June 2021. Um, but for now, tons of active glider operations and tons of jump operations. So of course we landed there many, many times in our few short weeks. It may look like I was doing a low pass here. It was precautionary. I'm sure something was wrong. It was not a low pass. So this one wasn't actually on the parade route, but I do want to mention it because of how important uh, the uh, EVA airfield was during the Pearl Harbor attack. So when Lieutenants Welch and Taylor took off of Holly EVA up in the north here, they saw all the Japanese aircraft going for EVA. EVA was the first site to be attacked during Pearl Harbor, and uh, all 48 aircraft were destroyed. Um, so now you can barely tell. We've got these little, little huts here. These were uh, aircraft shelters, and it's now filled with cows. But it's kind of unfortunate because of how important EVA is to our history, and there really isn't a memorial site. There aren't plaques. It's not somewhere you can go visit. You can fly over and like, oh yes, the farmer has his cows here. So um, there is a movement on Oahu to actually start up a memorial that's centered by some uh, general aviation folks um, out here, um, trying to put together a memorial. So hopefully they can pick up some steam and, and make something good happen. And then, of course, the last sites on the parade route, the absolute feature here, we have Ford Island again. Um, I included this photo. Does anybody recognize this tower? You've probably seen that tower uh, featured in, I think it was in Tora Tora Tora. It was in the Pearl Harbor movie. That tower was actually not there during, uh, uh, during World War II. So the actual tower is about a third the height. It's little. Uh, so that, that nice iconic tower, that wasn't actually contemporary, but um, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum is working on restoring it, and um, so you can get a tour where you can go to the top of it and you get this phenomenal view. So they, they want it to be a little uh, uh, historically centered event center at some point, so that should be really nice in the near future. And we have the USS Missouri that we flew over, and then the Arizona Memorial. So the sea state was exceptionally flat on this day. Uh, if you look closely, you can actually see the entire outline of the ship. So the buoy here and the buoy here ma mark the, the bow and the stern. And because the sea state was so calm on this day, you could actually see the oil pooling from spilling out originally on the Arizona. Um, they haven't been able to contain it. Um, this, this was just a, an absolutely touching view, and I am thoroughly blessed to have been able to take part in this adventure and witness this and be a part of it for myself. Um, so that's, that's why we were doing this, was to keep this memory alive. An absolutely unreal experience. So there's an endless list of people that I have to thank, but now I can include you on that list. Thank you for helping me keep <laughs> this history alive from my perspective and also these events that occurred. Uh, so thank you very much for your invitation here. Uh, so I tried to keep the presentation short enough to entertain questions and tell you some more stories. Uh, if anybody is interested, I can just stand here for about four more hours and continue <laughs> talking. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Yes, we've got one here. Oh, what happened to the B-25? We, we lost more than two aircraft on this trip. So the B-25 didn't make it home. B-25 did make it to California, so they unloaded at North Island Naval Air Station. Uh, the owner, David Prescott, eminently generous, uh, just told the crew, just hemorrhage cash, I don't care, take every veteran, everybody who helped you, take them for a B-25. Everybody gets B-25 rides. I had two B-25 rides when I was in Hawaii. 
Um, they stayed a few extra days in North Island, just given rides. They wanted to make sure any sailor who wanted one or was available could go up. Then we met up at Chino um, to watch the check ride of the guy who owns the TBM that came on the adventure. He wasn't flying his own TBM, he was flying his T6 because he hadn't gotten a chance to get his check ride yet. So the B-25 was there, a whole bunch of us showed up to celebrate this man's check ride. Then the B-25 took off, went to Stockton, took off heading towards Albany, dual engine failure, and landed in a field. Three individuals on board, everybody survived. Two had broken backs and went to the hospital. One walked away. Yep, old is glory. It, is it repairable? Or no. Can we get it for the museum? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what David Prescott's plans for it are, but um, it, it hit hard, though. That, that fuselage is wrecked. But lucky everybody, everybody from the B-25 survived. Uh, there was one other um, incident on the trip. Uh, so when we were getting on the ship, Right, so the captain said, like originally it was gonna be 35 people riding the ship back. We're gonna have a whole party of civilians on the USS Essex. We're gonna get in their way. Um, well, because of COVID, the captain said, no, 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 you can have one person per aircraft maximum and that's it to watch your airplanes. So that's why I was especially lucky that I was able to go. But a part of this, of course, well, you gotta get a COVID test before you get on the ship. One of our guys failed his COVID test. No symptoms, so we thought, oh, all right, well, you know, tough luck for me. It was one of the PUI Catalina pilots all four Catalina pilots came down with COVID, three of them very symptomatic, and Fred Owens passed away two weeks ago. Yes, so we, we did lose one. Um, otherwise, healthy gentleman, but he was 83 at the time. Um, the bright side of it was Fred and his son Jason, their last adventure together was flying a PBY Catalina around Oahu in commemoration of 75 years since the end of World War II. So it's always too soon, but if you're gonna go, that's, that's a heck of a way to go. <laughs> uh, the PBY Catalinas were actually, where do you find PBY Catalina pilots? Nobody has a PBY Catalina rating. So the PBYs were actually sitting in North Island um, up until last, no, five days ago was when they got the second one out because they had no pilots. They had to wait for that set to recover. So when, when I say thank you to the volunteers on this trip, just the level of challenges they had to deal with were completely unreal. It was far beyond like logistics of moving airplanes around. They were contending with the governor who was changing his mind about how to handle COVID, you know, just COVID itself and coping with everything being closed and still trying to find accommodations and still make it a wonderful event for us. So it, it, it was phenomenal and uh, just so lucky to have been involved. Yes, sir. You have your airplane. Was that to commemorate the fact that there was a uh, stairman in the air when the December 7th attack took place? Oh, so this is another interesting fact. So Tora 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 did depict that there was a steerman in the air during the attack. There was a general aviation aircraft flying around, but it wasn't a steerman. It was actually an Aronka, it was a TC-65, which they actually have that aircraft hanging in the museum in Oahu. Like the same aircraft, not just the type, but the aircraft that was in the air in the time and, and had to do an emergency landing dodging zeros. Uh, so, no, the steerman was there, um, actually there were supposed to be um, like upwards of 30 World War II aircraft that wanted to go on, and then COVID hit and people started backing out, and so suddenly they were like, oh, we're having trouble getting planes, we better gather all the T6s, there's always T6s available, and so really they are taking anybody who wanted to go at that point. So the steerman was contemporary to World War II, you know, this was, ours is a 1942, so not contemporary to Pearl Harbor, but contemporary to the signing of the Articles of Surrender, and it was an active trainer at the time. Don't ask me about the T-28. Yes? Tell me about the T-28. <laughs> <laughs> not contemporary. First of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Regarding the P-51, did you get to meet my very good friend, Dr. Dr. Kendall Wagner, oh my gosh, Wags. He did give me a ride in P-51. Yeah, I got one too. Oh yeah, so get this, so yeah, Wags, he's, he's on the plane for what, 12 years? 12 years and he's put 800 hours on it. The man flies his P-51. <laughs> yeah, and was also, you know, he was also on the ship on the way back and got in more trouble than anyone else on the ship. So not only did we nose our way onto the bridge, but Wags was actually driving the ship for part of it. He convinced the sailors to let him, to let him steer it for a while. He's also a brilliant surgeon. He is. 
Yes, he's a, one of the many personalities I was thrilled to have met on that trip. What are you going to do next to top that trip? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Well, it depends who's going to bankroll it. So. <laughs> I will go adventure for money. <laughs> So, yeah, nothing in the works as of he'll, yet. He'll tell you how to write a book about it. <laughs> I could use some advice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anything else? Yes. So, where is your sermon now? Oh, so um, it actually had to go into annual within a week of us getting back. <laughs> so we dropped it off at annual, and it's fine now. It's currently sitting in a hangar to hatch pee while our checkbooks recover. So... <laughs> But you know, Stearman made it home, and the way I'd been thinking about this trip is, oh my gosh, we're going to have all these challenges, then we're going to get to North Island Naval Air Station, and then we're basically home, it's in our backyard, this is going to be a boring flight. We've done this tons of times, so I don't know. Battery was still dead. <laughs> um, my goggles broke on that trip. Um, so yeah, I had to do a takeoff in the Stearman, my goggles broke, and the first thing that flashes through my mind is that story my friend told me of a guy who wrecked his Stearman when his goggles broke on takeoff. So that was a, another stressful moment for like, all right, just don't hit the ground, all right, fiddle with this eventually. And that, that, that was a whole to-do of like the strap was broken and the only way I could keep them from flooding around my face was to fully loosen what was left, grab it, and then hook it around my leather helmet so it was like dragging on my neck for an hour. And you know, following Dustin, he's navigating because at this point I have no capability to navigate, but I haven't told him exactly what's going on other than, hey, I'm really, really angry and I want to land as quick as we can. <laughs> And we get on the ground, I'm like, I can't breathe. Um, and then we get up to Cone Pass. Does everybody know where that is? So that's the, yeah, between um, LA Basin and getting to the high desert. Um, you come up the pass, you get through the mountains, and it opens up, and you see your beautiful, glorious desert with tons of great visibility, unless your entire state's on fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> visibility was one mile. <laughs> so. So we put our bellies on the ground, one, so it was legal, and two, we could tell where we were. Um, and then, so, you know, we're, we're a couple hundred feet off the ground, and we're trying to get back to Mojave, and I'm like, please, I just want to see the 14. If I can see the 14, I can follow my way up the pass to Tehachapi. We get to the 14, I'm like, yes, everything's going to be okay. Engine shuts off. Like, dang it. <laughs> it was... It was only half a second, but it was long enough to get my attention and get me very upset. So, you know, jam the mixture up, because we still had the green stuff running through it, so that was probably what it was, here's hoping. Um, yeah, I'd pop up to 1,000 feet so that I have enough altitude to do a power off 180 onto the highway if need be. Like, hey, Dustin, we may land at Mojave. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, we get up to Mojave, I'm like, love everything's looking fine. Let's just drive on back to the hatch feet and park it. <laughs> No, so it's the trip isn't over until it's over. <laughs> yes. Is all they ran over there was the, the leaded fuel that it had, it had no low lead? So there is one eccentric dude who gets hundred low lead shipped in. So if you uh, go to the fuel pumps um, at Barber's Point, Kalealoa, same airport, just two different names. I usually say Kalealoa because I'm so proud that I learned how to pronounce it. But if you go to Kalealoa, the fuel pumps actually do have 100 low lead. It's a good deal more expensive because they do ship it in from the continental United States. Um, but uh, because there aren't many transient general aviation aircraft, everybody assumes you know it's green stuff. So nobody's going to go out of their way to tell you, right? And if you're not fully draining your tank, even if you're just topping it up a little bit, you know, it's blue, green, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just bluish. Hard to tell that there's actually a difference. So why did they use, why did they It's locally sourced and it's green. What do you want? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, so the serious answer is, um, uh, so 100, full green, full lead, um, that's what used to be manufactured everywhere. Um, and you had to upgrade your equipment, and not necessarily anything more complicated, but it's a different set of refining equipment. Um, the refinery in Oahu just never upgraded because the demand's so low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is a DC-6 out there totally unrelated to the trip that we did fly, because um, we're really good at making friends. Um, but uh, that's using up uh, a lot of uh, the 100 green stuff. Um, so their demand just increased by one DC-6 at least. Mm -hmm. It's staged out there for oil dispersant, but yeah, they, still, they still run out of gas. We're Navy, we call it a C-180. I like it. I like it. And yeah, I think somebody said Sam. Yeah, it's Sam. Yeah, Sam. Sam. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he was actually going to let us land the DC-6, which we're not multi-engine pilots. He was going to let us land it, and the crosswind picks up. 
<laughs> Another really good person to have met. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this place was filled with characters. But yeah, the P-51 ride, the, uh, um, the B-25 rides uh, were all phenomenal. The PBY guys say they owe me a ride, so I gotta go hunt them down. It really was. No, it, it was uh, it was phenomenal to see, and yeah, my, my only regret with it is that it was planned to be so much more, and it was out of everybody's control. But um, there's one event I was really looking forward to. We were supposed to have a formal dinner on the USS Missouri with World War II veterans flown out. Yeah, we couldn't do it. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I am grateful for everything that I was able to be a part of, and desperately want to go back because even though we did go through the museum we did get to see the Missouri we did get to see the memorials um, we didn't have a tremendous amount of time so I want to go back and really see it one thing that I thought was very amazing one display at the museum they actually have a Kate Japanese bomber um, it is severely deteriorated I mean no cockpit it's most of a fuselage a wing box most of one wing the other one's totally gone and it's the most complete Kate in existence now, I'd always wondered, you know, why we never saw like, Japanese aircraft on display like we saw, you know, American World War II aircraft on display. Um, I, you know, I wondered, is it, was it cultural? Did they just not want to save it? No, it was actually uh, metallurgical differences. Like, the metal just didn't survive nearly as well as what the American aircraft did. And that's why you don't see many examples of Japanese World War II aircraft. But it's just so surreal to see because it's just this heavily corroded hulk that's vaguely airplane shaped. Oh, and that's all that's left. Oh, no kidding. You gotta come to our museum. Well, I gotta come back then. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a Tolkien collector. It's a member of the museum that has full cockpits on display, Japanese aircraft. Mm -hmm. He's been collecting since he was a kid in the 80s. No kidding. And he has a full display in our radio room of Japanese aircraft radios that are apparently very rare. He was collecting as a, most of, a lot of them have been bought up by Japanese collectors and taken back to Japan, mm -hmm. but all World War II. Does it play Japanese? How unusual. Music on it? <laughs> oh, that's absolutely phenomenal. I've never seen anything like that. And what an amazing thing to have. I'm just going back and I'm flipping to the, the fun slide to look at. There we go. That's more fun. There's tons of photos. Yeah, so uh, one thing that was really fun was the uh, photo in the bottom left corner here. You can't really make it out, but um, it says, do uh, you remember how I mentioned it's not so easy to tow the aircraft from Pearl Harbor to Hickam because it's four miles through base housing? So this was my first experience really dealing with the Navy. When the Navy has a mission, they get it done, and that was so cool to see. So I was active duty Air Force. I'm an Air Force veteran. Um, watching the Air Force work on this trip, watching the Army work on this trip, the Air Force and the Army have rules. The Navy has a mission. <laughs> They're going to get it done. <laughs> so they were so disappointed that we weren't able to do community outreach, that we weren't able to involve you know, the people who are listening to these engines. And I'm like, well, I wish we could go see those, right? So what they did was, like, they chopped down Pearl Harbor contemporary trees so that we could get the planes through the <laughs> base. And so um, the idea was, oh, the families will come out of their house and they'll wave and they'll be kind of nice. No, they were out in force. Oh my gosh, there were so many families, so many kids, so many cyclists, just everybody lining the streets, socially distanced, because they're on their own property. Um, and so we dragged the aircraft four miles. I know it was four miles because that's what my watch said when I was done running. Um, so Dustin and I jogged alongside, you know, to watch the wingtips of the aircraft. And I, I watched him almost nail a T6 into a street sign. It was kind of funny. <laughs> they had it cleared. They just were a little off center. They almost, they almost got it, but they caught it in time. So we were running along just to, you know, watch the wingtips, but also to actually, like, see the families and the kids. And so, yeah, all, all the planes were, um, so there were three of them that were just directly towed, and then all the rest of them, except for the, the B-25 and the PBYs are too big. I mean, the PBY Kenley is enormous. It's a 104-foot wingspan, so no. Um, but uh, they, they dragged all the rest of them through ba base housing so that people could take photos and experience it. It was so cute. Like, he had a bunch of, there was, I was actually a little disappointed. Only one group of kids figured out you could do this to get the truck drivers to honk their horns. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we need to spread the word on that to the grade schoolers because it works still. <laughs> so that was something that was actually beautiful to see. Mm 
Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, everybody.